Today, I want to speak a a message today. It's entitled, Speaking the Wisdom of God. And if you'll just get your Bibles out and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 7. We'll stand just for the reading of those two verses. Amen. 1 Corinthians 2, 6 and 7. When you get there, say amen. Amen. Hallelujah. How many of you know we're blessed to be able to have the word of God so that we can hold, we can read, we can do these things because there are countries in which you cannot have the Bible openly. You will be considered a criminal. But we are blessed. Amen. If you're blessed, say amen. Amen. If you found 1 Corinthians 2, 6 and 7, say amen. Amen. Hallelujah. It reads thus. How be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that came to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. You may be seated. We want to talk to you about speaking the wisdom of God, even the hidden wisdom. See, there's wisdom, but also in the Bible, it tells us that there is a hidden wisdom. This wisdom is so profound that when you read uh, further in verse eight, it says, which none of the princes of this world knew for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. You see, Satan and the princes of this world did not know who Jesus was. And this was a mystery. This was wisdom that was kept secret. And so we're going today to investigate this from the scriptures. Because only the scriptures can reveal the scriptures. I can't reveal it to you by what I think or what I know or what I've read in a book. But only the scriptures can reveal the scriptures. Only the scriptures can reveal who Jesus is. And Jesus is the word that was made flesh and dwelt among us. Hallelujah. So I want us to look at this and we're going to go through this. Why a mystery? Why would God put this whole thing in a mystery? What is the big deal? Have you ever had maybe a surprise or something you were trying to to do for somebody? But there's some people you can't tell because they have a saying. They say they can't hold water. If you were to tell somebody, oh, well, they're going to tell everybody. How many of you ever planned like a surprise party for somebody? Have you ever done that? You ever been part of a surprise? Now look, don't tell them. We're going to go over here. We got to do this. We do this. Well, guess what? God did something different. He did something similar. He didn't just reveal it all to everybody. He waited till a certain time because the enemy, who's the enemy, by the way? Who? Satan is the enemy. He had to keep something secret so that something could be uh, done. He was going to uh, uh, pay a price for our sin, but would the devil knowingly kill God or try to? How many of you in here would try to kill God? Come on now. How many of you thought if, if, now first off, what do we know about God? God is what kind of being? He's a spirit. Can you kill a spirit? So wouldn't you be a fool to try to kill God if he's a spirit? But this is part of the mystery. This is part of what was wrapped up. God himself would come to the earth to pay a price for our sin. But if the devil knew who he was, do you think he would try to kill him? No, he wouldn't try to kill him because I can't kill God. I can't kill God. See, the devil had some issues. The demons had issues. Here's Jesus, who is Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. As Jesus would go places and the people that were possessed with devils, they would start acting up and he would say, come out of them. And what would they do? They'd come out. Now, they didn't know exactly who he was because no one knew God in the flesh. They only knew him as being a what? Spirit. And when this... Jesus would speak and say, come out of him. And they would come out. They had to obey. They they weren't even sure. This is why the Bible tells us in verse 8 here, it says, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, you're saying, well, what do you mean by princes? Oh, yes, Pilate and them. But who were they being directed by? The enemy. Satan himself. Didn't you know that it says that Satan is the, he's the prince of, of the power of the what? Of the air. 
He's a spiritual being. He's over this earth. Here he is. He's here. He's, he's very active. If this prince, the devil, knew who he was, he would have never had him crucified. This is powerful. This is so. So why a mystery? Let's see. What what is this? A mystery is if I told you something, it's a mystery, something that's kept hidden. Do you know what parables are? Parables are things in which there's a story told. And some people will receive something from it and others will be like. Have you ever been on the inside before? Like there was a joke and somebody said something and it was one of those inside jokes that you had to already be a part of something to know it. And then you see people and some people are laughing. The rest of people are going, what? What? Oh, I guess I had to have been there. Or I guess I had to have heard this. Look in Matthew 13, 10. I want you to see about the parables. Watch this. This is something, this is something very interesting. We have to build a, a case here so that we can understand speaking of wisdom of God. Look at this. Matthew chapter 13. Look in verse 10 through 17 here. The disciples wanted to know because when Jesus would speak, he would speak mysteriously. He would be speaking things and people, some people would understand and a lot of people wouldn't. So look what he says. The disciples had a good question. Now, the disciples came and asked Jesus a question because they knew Jesus. Have you ever felt like you were comfortable? You could go ask somebody a question because you knew him. Let's say it was a teacher and you had him the year before. And now you're in their class again at, in college and you see him and you say, hey, uh, Professor so-and-so, I just wanted to ask this question. This you feel more comfortable because you had them a previous semester. Well, guess what? The disciples had been around Jesus and look what they do in verse 10. It says, and the disciples came and said unto him, that is Jesus, why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Look at this. So he's saying, he says, why do you speak unto them? He's talking about the people in general abroad. Why are you talking to them in parables, Jesus? He said, because it's given unto you to know the what? What's it say? The mysteries. It's given unto you to know the mysteries of what? Not just any mystery of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Look at this. For whosoever hath to him shall be given and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Esaias, or Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. Why? Look at this. For this people's heart is waxed gross and their ears are dull of hearing and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. When he's talking about being converted, what is he talking about here? Salvation. He's talking about being converted, being translated out of this life into the life to come. He's saying some of these people, because their heart is not right, their eyes are closed. Have you ever heard? Have you ever seen somebody? I won't put it on you. Have you ever seen somebody that when they tell them something, even though it, and they show them it's truth, then they still deny it? Now, I'm going to use this. This is a bad example, but I'm telling you now it's a bad example. It's just like on, on the times being on the ambulance uh, or in my position in the fire department, I had to go tell somebody that they had a family member that was deceased. You know, and when you show up and you say, listen, I, I want to I need to tell you that so and so today this happened and they've died. We've they've passed. On. No, no, no. Now, of course, they're traumatically struck. Now, this is a bad example, like I said already. Right. You go to them and you tell them this person is. No, it can't die. Does that mean that person didn't die? No, it's the truth, right? And it takes time for them to eventually come and say, because it's so much all of a sudden on a person. It's very traumatic. And I didn't like to be the one in the shoes, but I got voted in. Sometimes you have to go. You'd have to make the, the call. You'd have to be the one to go. OK, so I'd go. But the thing is, God has sent me on something even more. Uh, uh, it's a higher calling, which is to bring, guess what? The mystery of who God is to you. Sometimes I'm here to tell you, sometimes when people hear this mystery, it's even greater than telling somebody that your family member has died because it's so traumatic that people begin to deny it. No, no. Why? Because of traditions, because of their family members, and they can't receive the truth. 
See, once you, once you begin to share the truth with people, they, some people just close their eyes. I don't want to hear it. I, so this is an issue. This is an issue. But it takes an act of God. Look at this. But look at verse 16. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. What do they see? What do the disciples see right now? Who are they looking at? God. They're looking at Jesus, who is what? God manifested in the flesh. He's the man. Blessed are your eyes for what you see and what you hear. Why? He's speaking what? The word of God. Matter of fact, the word was made what? Flesh. flesh and dwelt among us. Blessed are your eyes. Because the rest of the people that were there, they would see. He would reveal who he was. And guess what? No, you're not. You're not God. So this, he said, but blessed are you. Look at this for 17. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which you see. What things are they seeing? God walk among them doing the supernatural. Look at this. And have not seen them and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. They would love to hear God himself, see God himself teaching. Hearing the words of God, seeing the profound miracles that he was producing. But all these people that are here, not all of them would be able to receive that. Only some of them. Only some could receive. Amen. So let's take a look here. Look in Romans chapter 16, verse 25. Now this is Paul. We're going to deal with Paul here in just a second. Romans 16, verse 25 to the end of the chapter, or, uh, verse 27. So 25 through 27. When you get there, say amen. amen. Now watch this. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel. Now what is the gospel? The death, the burial, resurrection of Jesus. That's, that's, and that's how we obey it. We repent. We're baptized in the name of Jesus. We receive the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in tongues. And the gospel is, means, what is the Greek? The gospel means what in the Greek? What does it mean? The good news. He said, look at this. this is, and when you establish something, you create something. Look, now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the what? Mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith to God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. So I got a question for you. Look at this up here. How long was the mystery kept a secret? What does it say in your Bible? Beginning, Beginning of what? The world began. Ah, so from day one in the beginning, when that when that took place. Guess when the secret was taking place? Then. There was already a secret. But when, look at this. Now when and to whom was it revealed? When was the mystery revealed? Look in your Bible. It just told you. Look at verse 26. What's the first line in verse 26? But now. What does now mean? Right now. But now is made manifest. And how was it made manifest? I told you a while ago, you can only uh, look at the scripture. The scriptures will reveal what? The things of God. The scriptures will reveal the things in the Bible. Look at how was this mystery re revealed? But now is made manifest. And look, by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience. See, this secret, this mystery had been kept a secret since the very beginning of time. Hallelujah. This means even before Lucifer, before any of the angels or created beings, then guess what? There was a secret and they didn't know it. He creates the whole world and this is a big secret. But there was a day, there was a time in which he was going to reveal it. And guess what it was? It was afterwards, once he had risen from the dead, once he had come back from life, he come back from death, he did what? He began to reveal to people what? This is who I am. This was when the revelation began. So that's why he says, but now is made known. Not, not before Jesus was raised. This is why he told him, he says, he says, ye shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. 
How is it going to set you free? What is it about truth that can set me free? What was truth? In John 17, 17, which I've had you read so many times before, it says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. How would the word sanctify us or make us holy? Well, the word became flesh and blood. See, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission or payment of sin. The soul that sinneth shall surely die. So when the word became flesh and blood, it now had a means of making payment for your sin and my sin. And if we didn't keep this mystery secret, then the devil himself would have never made sure that he was crucified. Does this make sense? Hallelujah. Let's look at Saul here. Paul, he was later named Paul. He was a Jew. He was monotheistic. What does that mean? What does mono mean? One, single. Theistic means God. He believed in one God. He didn't believe in a multiplicity of gods. Do you know out of all the religions then, that were back then and even to this day, guess what? The religions are, guess what? One God believers, guess what? The Egyptians, guess what? They had a triunity. The, even today, the Indians, the, in the India, they, have, they have their own trinity. All of pagan religions, guess what they all had? A trinity. Do you know what made the Israelites different than any of the other people at the time? They believed in one God. That's why even today, among Jewish people, if you started talking to them about the Trinity, they say, we don't believe what you believe. We believe in one God and only one God. And when you start trying to say, well, see, we believe there's this mystical three, and we got that, that's all from paganism. Has nothing to do with the word of God. Matter of fact, then Paul was also a Pharisee. He was of a sect, very strict sect of Jews. Very strict sect of Jews. And guess what? He believed in one God and only one God. And this is what De- Deuteronomy 6, 4. You see it up there? It says the Shema, the Shema. What is that? It's simply this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is what? One Lord. Not one of many. He's only one. Hallelujah. Let's look in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1 through 5. Go to Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Hallelujah. Now we're still looking at this speaking of God. We're learning about a mystery here. When you get there, say amen. Amen. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me to you word. He's he's telling you the cause. Look in verse one for this cause. He's telling you the reason why he's teaching and preaching something. Look at this. And it's for it's for these 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 Christians in Ephesus. Look at this. Verse three. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge In the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Got some questions for you. Look up here. Who is he that made known the mystery? Who made known the mystery to Paul? If you don't know, don't say. Who made known the mystery? If you know it, say it. Not sure. Well, we'll see it here in a minute. Watch this. What is the mystery concerning What is the mystery concerning? Look in your Bible. It tells you. We just read it. Look what it says. The mystery of Christ. So what is all this mystery about? It's about Jesus Christ. It's what the mystery is all about. Well, who is he? Who is this Jesus? This is what the mystery is all about. It's about Christ. Who is he that made known the mystery? We're going to see. Look at this. When did Paul receive the mystery? Now, in Acts chapter 9, it has it there. You can go back and read that. The one that's a little more concise is in Acts 22. Let's go to Acts 22. I want you to see when Paul, he he relays his story of his conversion. See, you can't be converted without knowing who Jesus is. Now, how many gods did Paul believe in? One. One God. If you told him, well, there's three gods, he's going to say, what, are you crazy? No, there's only one God. 
Go to Acts 22, verse 6 through 17. We're going to look at this. He's giving his testimony. You see, he was a Jew. He was a Pharisee. That was, that was the, the, the church, so to speak, he went to. He was a Pharisee. Well, watch this. And it came to pass that as I made my journey and was come nigh unto Damascus about noon, suddenly there shone from where? Heaven. A great light round about me. Isn't Jesus the what? I am the way, the truth, the light. He said, I am the light of the... Look at that. Look at this. So he said, a great light, not just a regular light, a great light round about me showed up. Look. And I fell into the ground and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Now, why does he say, why are you persecuting me? We read this last week because he is what? The temple of God. When you are converted, you become one what? Flesh with him and you are his temple. You become one body with him. So notice what he's saying. Why are you, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting them? Why are you persecuting me? This is all part of the mystery. Look at this. And I answered and said, who art thou, Lord? Now, when he says, who art thou, Lord? How many gods does he believe in? He only believes in one God. So he wants to know, hey, wait a minute, who are you? Who is this? I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. Uh Uh-oh, revelation just came. Who is this one God that he believes in? It's Jesus of Nazareth. Watch this. And they that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? He didn't say, what should I do, Jesus? He said, who art thou, Lord? Because he only believed in one God. Now he says, what? And he says, what? He says, and I said, what shall I do, Lord? Who has he now made recognition who Jesus is, is who? God. He's the Lord. Look, he says, what shall I do, Lord? Now, wait a minute. I'm going to ask you this question before we go any further. Who did he commission to preach the gospel? Who did Jesus commission to preach the gospel, to go out into the whole world and preach the gospel? It was the church, humanity. He had the disciples. He said, sent them out. Now, watch this. Watch this, because people will miss this. He says, and I said, what shall I do, Lord? So what does he need to know about? He needs to know about salvation, doesn't he? Watch this. And the Lord said unto me, Repent, be baptized. And he didn't say that, did he? What did he say? Arise and go into Damascus and there it shall be told thee of all things which are appointed for thee to do. God would not tell him the gospel because he would be breaking his own word. Because he commissioned who? The disciples. He, he commissioned you and I to do what? To go and preach the gospel. He says, you arise and you go to Damascus and there's going to be someone that's going to tell you what you need to do. See, God's not going to break his word. If he said, okay, I'm going to tell you all about it. He's breaking his word. He told that the gospel would have to be preached. If God tells him right then, he's breaking his own word. But did you catch that before? No. Watch this. Watch this. Okay. Verse 11. And when I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of them that were with me, I came into Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked upon, up upon him. Now watch this. And he said, the God of our fathers hath chosen thee. Now wait a minute. Who did he talk to on the road to Damascus? Who did Saul talk to on the road to Damascus? Who called him out? Now look, and so Jesus chose him. Now look what he calls him. Look what Ananias says. The God of our fathers hath chosen thee. Who chose him? Jesus. Who's the God of the fathers? Jesus. Hallelujah! That thou shouldest know his will and see, look, that just one. Not the just three, not the just two, that thou would see that just one and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. So the voice of his mouth, which is the word of God, which came and was made flesh, is who? It's Jesus. When he sees him, the God of his fathers was Jesus. It was the word of God that was speaking to him. This is the mystery. This is what Paul received. 
he said, I've received it. It's the mystery of Christ. But who revealed it to him? Who revealed the mystery to him? Jesus. I am Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look at this. Uh, let's keep reading here. Uh, verse 15. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. And now, look at this. Now, we got, now we, we've done this. Now we've got to get through some formalities here. Now that you know who he is, we've got to make sure that you've been converted. Watch this. And now, why Terius, why are you waiting, thou? Arise and do what? Be baptized and do what? Wash away thy sins, calling on the, calling on the name of the Lord. What? See, he acknowledged who Jesus was. Here he is. He's in a state of repentance. He's blind. He receives his sight. You remember in the garden when Adam and Eve, when they took of the fruit, their eyes were open, but they became close to what? The things of God. They were blinded. They saw now that they were naked. Here, God blinds Paul or Saul at the time supernaturally. And when the scales fall from his eyes, he sees and he's already been seeing who God is. Who art thou, Lord? I am Jesus. When Ananias tells him the God of our fathers has chosen thee, his, the scales have really fallen because he knows who he is. He knows that Jesus is the one true and living God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So look at this. And then he says, hey, hey, what are you waiting for? Come on, get up. Go get baptized. And when you get baptized, what's going to happen to your sins? Wash away thy sins. Was it because Paul was stanky? Was that what it was? His underarm smelled like he was grilling hamburgers? Yeah, you need to get that sin off you, dog. No, it's because where is sin found? In the body. And it's the form of circumcision. So what happens when you go down in the water in the name of Jesus? He cuts away that filthy body of sin and he clothes you with himself, the word of God. This is a mystery. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look at this. So who did Paul learn the mystery from? Well, we see here that it was God. He learned that, hey, oh man, I, who art thou, Lord? I am thee. But let's, let's ask Paul. Let's ask Paul directly. Where did he get this whole revelation from? Maybe somebody had taught him this. Maybe somebody had taught him that there was only one God or that this God was Jesus. Maybe, maybe that's the case. Let's ask him. Let's ask Paul. Let's go into scriptures. Go to first uh, to Galatians chapter one, verse 11. Go to Galatians one and 11. Let's ask Paul. How did you how did you receive this? How did you get this mystery? Where'd you get this mystery from, man? You, you get it out of a commentary. Did you go online? Did you Google it? How'd you find out about it, Paul? You, you're there in Galatians one eleven. Look at this. It says, but I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. Guess what? He didn't get this from a man. Oh, really, Paul? You didn't get this from a man? Well, where'd you get it from, Paul? I'm glad you asked. Look at verse 12. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. What is a revelation? What's a revelation? Let's see. Watch this, watch this. Behind this folder that you see, I will soon reveal to thee what is behind it. What is it? Do you know? Does any of you know what is behind this folder? A revelation. So when I reveal it, it's do what? It's an empty box. I just revealed it to you. You couldn't see it. You couldn't understand it. Until it was revealed. Paul says, I didn't, reveal, I didn't receive this revelation from man. Who did he get it from? Jesus Christ himself. Keep reading. Look at this. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the what? 
traditions of my father. He was moving up in rank. There's churches like that today. I mean, if you do this, if you say this, you do, guess what? We'll move you up in the church. That's what Paul was doing. He said, man, I was moving up. I was moving on up to the sky. Right? He was moving up in the church. He was persecuting the church, but he was not in truth. He had not received the revelation, the mystery of who God was. Watch this. Verse 15. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. Guess what? He was called while he was in the womb of God, even though he was persecuting the church. Look at this. To reveal what? His son in me that I might preach him. Who is him? Jesus among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. What does that mean? He conferred not with flesh and blood. He didn't ask man their opinion. After all, where did he get this revelation from? God himself. If you get it from God himself, then do you need to ask a man if it's right? No. Look at this. Neither, now watch this. Verse 17. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. Guess what he did? He said, after he received this revelation, he sat down somewhere. He went to, to Arabia. He went into the desert. Then he came back to Damascus. How long did he spend when he was there? Three years. Doing what? He was learning about what? God. He said, I didn't go ask the apostles and say, what do you think about this? What is it? After God had revealed himself and he learned of the gospel and these things, you know what he did? He spent three years time with God and then he comes and he talks to only one of the disciples one of the apostles and who was it that he talked to? Peter. Peter. That was it. Hallelujah. Now, what did he learn? Let's go back to verse 6 now in the same chapter. I want you to see this because he's talking to a church here that had gotten away from the gospel. He was shocked because this mystery from God. Look at this. Look in verse 6. You there? He's talking to the church in Galatia. Look, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him. So removed from who? Jesus. You've been removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. These people were all, this is, how many years ago was this? This is when the gospel was being preached fresh. And even in the church, people were being, beginning to leave the gospel. He said, I'm marveling. You're so soon removed. How many years has it been since then? Do you think some people have been removed from the gospel today? Oh, you best believe it has. Look at this. He said, which is not another one. There's not another gospel. Look at this. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. What is the gospel? The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What did they teach in the word of God? It was repentance, baptism in the name of Jesus, and receiving the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in tongues. They only spoke one gospel. They preached that it was one God. They preached that Jesus was the word that was made flesh. He wasn't two beings. He wasn't 100% human in dust and 100% God. And the God side would pray to the, I mean, the human side would pray to the God side. That is heresy. They didn't. That's removing. That's changing the gospel. Nowhere does it say that the human side prayed to the God side. It only tells us that there was one true and living God. And that is the great mystery. That God was made flesh. Emmanuel. God with us. And look he says. If I come back and preach something different to you. Or if Joe Blow down the road is teaching something different to you. Don't you receive it because you have already received the true gospel. But that person that comes and teaches anything different, let them be cursed. It was so important. So look at the very next verse. Look, verse eight. I mean, verse nine. And as we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you, then that ye have received, let him be accursed. 
Watch this. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Why does he say that? Because he was in the Jews' religion. He was being promoted. He was moving on up. He was doing one of If he wanted to continue in that, he could have. I can keep going. But did I want to please men or did I want to please God? I just found out who God was. And I was persecuting him and his church. Hallelujah. When truth comes, we'll do either three things. Either we will acknowledge it, we'll deny it, or we will ignore it. Paul was a one God believer and was persecuting the church until he acknowledged the truth. Paul had to acknowledge the truth, not just any truth, he had to acknowledge the truth that was after godliness. Look in Titus chapter 1, the first three verses. Hallelujah. Be right after Timothy. Titus 1, verses 1 through 3. When you get there, say amen. It says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. Ah, now remember that word godliness there, watch this. In hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. When was the mystery? It was kept secret since before the world. So look, God already knew. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. But hath in due times manifested his what? His word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God, our Savior. Because how many saviors are there? There's only one. And it's God, our Savior. Because in the Old Testament, it says in Isaiah 43, 10 and 11, it says, it says, uh, but ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I've chosen, that ye may know, believe, and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there's no Savior. One God, no other Savior. So when you see Jesus, who is Emmanuel, God with us, you're looking at the Savior. He is the Savior of the world. And what did he do? He had to acknowledge what kind of truth? What does it say? Acknowledging the truth after what? Godliness. Godliness. Look at that. In quotations here. Godliness. Well, geez, why is that so important? Watch this. Y'all ready to see what he had to acknowledge the truth of? Go to 1 Timothy 3.16. Another. This is another. You go a few pages back. 1 Timothy into to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 3 and 16. This is what Paul had to acknowledge. He wrote the book of Timothy. He wrote it to Timothy. Look at this. 1 Timothy 3.16. What was he acknowledging the truth after what? Godliness. Let's see, let's see if we can see the same type of words here. Look at this. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. Who was? God was. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. What did Paul acknowledge? The truth after godliness. And what was the truth after godliness? That God was manifest in the flesh. What was his name? Jesus. Hallelujah. So is God trying to confuse us? Let's look at Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Come on. Let's be real here. People are going to ask this question. Come on, they're going to ask this question. You, you, you come along with me. I'm going to ask you before they ask it. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. You get there. Hallelujah. And somebody read that out loud. When you get there, read Matthew 28, 19. Just out loud for me. Because somebody's going to ask this question. Come on. Yeah, go ahead. Well, you know, just whoever's got it, read it. Son and of the Holy Ghost. 
Ah, now look at verse 20. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Now wait a minute, because I'm going to tell you now. The first thing people are going to do is say, well, you, you teach that you've got to be baptized in the name of Jesus. But Jesus himself said, baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Right? Is he trying to confuse us here? No. No. The Father had always been what? God is a spirit. He was referred to as a father. When Jesus came, he was the son. What? He was basically then, he was given unto humanity by, by God becoming flesh and blood, which was what? The son. But is it separate from the father? No, he's still the same. And matter of fact, in the spirit. So wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. But then look what he says. He says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always. Now, it looks like it's plural in verse 19 there, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. But then he says, do the things that I told you to do, and guess how many of them are going to be with you? And lo, I. How many is that? Only one God is going to be with you. And guess what his name is? Jesus. All right, now watch this. God is not trying to confuse us. Let's look in Zechariah chapter 14. Watch this. Go to Zechariah, the Old Testament. Beautiful book. Zechariah, it'll be almost to the end of the Old Testament. Zechariah chapter 14. Now, where did Jesus tell his disciples they needed to stay before they had to receive power? He said, go to Jerusalem. Do y'all remember how that, that Jesus talked about that, that there was living water? Y'all remember the living water? Okay, watch this. And keep all that in mind as we read this, okay? In Zechariah 14, verse 6, you get to say amen. It says, And it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall be clear, shall not be clear nor dark. Look, but it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day nor night, but it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light, and it shall be in that day that, watch this, living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, it says, half of them toward the former sea and half of them toward the hinder sea in summer and in winter shall it be. Now watch this. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. And in that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. Woo! So now somebody's going to turn around that I would be talking to somewhere on the street or somewhere else. And you know what they say? Well, see, that's, that's the Lord's name is one. See, that's his name. Are you serious? Are you meaning to tell me that we're supposed to call him one? Hey, uh, one. No, 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 no. His name is... Then they say, no, see, in the Spanish, he's for Juan. <laughs> no. One God. Where would this take place? Jerusalem. Wasn't it in Jerusalem after he was resurrected? When was the time for the mystery to come out? After resurrection. Look at this. So it was in Jerusalem. Hallelujah. Look at this. How many names would the Lord have? One. So when he says, go and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And he said, the name. What name was he talking about? Jesus. The name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Now let's look at the mystery of the Father. Do you see this? Go to John. Do you know that even Jesus said that he's not talking to us plainly about the Father? He even told us that. He said, but I'm going to talk to you plainly about him eventually. Look at John 16. Come on. Anybody getting anything out of this lesson today? Hallelujah. I had so much fun just, just as the Lord was showing me the scriptures and things to put together. I was having, I was having fun all by myself. Well, the Lord was with me. So, yeah, I guess the both of us. We, look at this. Look at verse 23. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Or he'll, give it, he'll give it you. Now, wait a minute. He said, whatever you ask in the name of the Father. Wait a minute. That makes it sound like there's another name. But Jesus said this. Y'all remember what he said? Jesus said, I have come in my Father's... Wait a minute. Did, did anybody get confused here? He said, whatever you ask in my Father's name. But then he also said, he said, I am come in my Father's... What's the Father's name? Come on now. Yes, Jesus. Look at this. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask and ye shall receive that your joy may be full. Now, wait a minute. He said you needed to ask in your father's name. Now, look in verse 24. He says, he says what? 
What did he ask for? He said, hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. He flipped right back to his name. Why can he say, ask in my father's name, and then you haven't asked anything in my name? Because guess what? They're one and the same. Come on now. Look at this. That your joy may be full. Verse 25. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs or parables, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. For the Father himself loveth you because ye have loved me and have believed and have believed that I came out from God. I came forth from the Father and am come into the world again. I leave the world and go to the Father. Okay. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly and speakest no proverb. And now are we sure that thou knowest all things and needest not any man should ask thee by this. We believe that thou camest forth from God. And Jesus answered them, do you now believe? Do you know what? There was still some, some doubt. There was still some of this. I mean, have you, ever, have you ever told somebody that you knew and you didn't really know? Yeah, man, uh, you know where uh, such and such is? Yeah, I, yeah, I know. All right. Well, let's get in the car. You drive. Uh, next thing you know. Well, well, <laughs> you, you, sometimes people just say, that, oh, yeah, yeah, nah, I know, I know, I know. He said, look, I'm going to speak to you plainly about the father. Here's what he said. He said, I'm going to speak to you plainly. He said, because you love me. He said, I came from the Father. Now, wait a minute. Y'all remember this? Jesus said this. Now, watch this. Here's another question I'll get. Jesus said that his Father is greater than he is. Apostolics. Man, why you got to pull that question out? You didn't pull out a dirty one. You snuck me under the belt. No, he didn't. The Father is a what? What is, what is God? He's, he's always been what? A spirit. When Jesus, who is the father that is made flesh, who is God, who is manifested in the flesh, when he says, the father is greater than I am, what does he mean? Now, wait a minute. God as a spirit, where is he not? I told you this before. I had an atheist ask me, he says, can you tell me exactly where God is right now? I said, I got one better for you, sir. You tell me where he's not. Okay, okay, you got me, you got me. I said, because he fills all time and space, right? God fills all time and space. Jesus said that his father was greater than he was. How is it that Jesus could say that? Who was in Christ? God, it says the spirit of God was in Christ doing what? Reconciling man unto himself. So Jesus, was Jesus in bodily form everywhere at the same time? No. No. But what about the spirit of God that fulfills all time and space? But he's in Christ at this time. But Christ, when he's in this bodily form, he's limited to where he goes, to what he's going. But God as a spirit is greater than who? Christ's bodily manifestation, the manifestation of God in the flesh. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Come on, somebody shake your head, please. Or y'all, people will be listening to this recording and say, see, he's twisting their minds. No, it makes sense. Because he's greater. In what magnitude as a spirit? But when he came, he wasn't coming to be great in magnitude as spirit. He was coming in the greatest manifestation available, which was in flesh and blood for one reason, so that he could redeem us to himself, so that we could be born again, so that we could become married to him and the two would become one flesh this is the mystery this is the wisdom of god that we're speaking now watch this go to john 14 1 through 14 we're in the same couple pages back see jesus asked them said y'all understand this now guess what they should have understood this a couple of chapters ago watch this when you get this amen. amen hallelujah watch this let not your heart be troubled Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Okay, now it sounds like we're talking about two gods again. He says, you believe in God, believe also in me. Why can he say that? Because he's who? You believe in God, believe also in me. Why? Because who is he? He's Emmanuel? God with us. Watch this. So look, because he explains it further in the chapter. Look, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. 
Now, you got to pick up on this too because I hear people preach this and it's wrong all the time. He says that there's already mansions in the Father's house, right? That's what it says in your Bible, right? But he's going to prepare a place for us. When everybody, you hear this next funeral you go to or somewhere and they talk about how they, I'm going to have my mansion. You're going to have your mansion. Everybody's going to have a mansion. That ain't what he just said. He said there's already mansions. There's already mansions there. He said what in that verse? He says, I go to do what? Prepare a place for you. Why is he preparing a place for you? Because we are his bride. You ain't going to stay in a mansion down the street, as they say. You're going to be down the street from, from the Lord. No, you're going to be in what? Together. Is that how it goes today? When you get married and you say, yeah, babe, I really love you. I'm going to make you a mansion. You stay way over there, okay? Now, you know, there's times when I know men and women probably like that husband and wife. Are like, yeah, man, we need a mansion. You, you cutting up. Get on down there to that mansion. No, but not our God. He says, no, I'm going to prepare a place for you. If you were here last week, then you know the, the place that he's gone to prepare is what? By converting us into this kingdom, this gospel, we become one with him because he is the temple. And we are the temple of what? The living God. Hallelujah. Watch this. He says, he says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. And where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Now, there, now there's some questions. Watch Thomas. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? How do we get there? Watch this. Jesus saith unto him, I am. Now, I am is what? That's singular, right? I am the way. How many ways are there into heaven? There's only one. I am the way. Okay, how many truths are they? Look, the truth, that's singular, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. And then that, that, that sounds like there's another God now, right? The Father, you can't come to him but by me. But who was in Christ? God, reconciling man unto himself. Do you know why you can't come unto God? Unless you go through Jesus, because your body is full of sin and he's holy. But his body would be the sacrifice that would take your sin and my sin upon it. And he would die. He would be buried and he would rise again. And if we obey him by following him in the gospel, the death, the burial and the resurrection, repentance, baptism in the name of Jesus and receiving the Holy Ghost. Then guess what happens? You can now have access to the father. Because guess what? You become one with his body. Okay, that's another. Okay, sorry. All right, look verse seven. Ah, here comes this. This is the mystery. Watch this. If ye had known me, ye would have known my Father also. And from henceforth, or from now on, ye know him and have seen him. Y'all remember this just a little while ago? Y'all remember this? Remember this? If ye had known me, you know, if all it. And what did he say? Read the verse for me. Read it. Read it for me. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. And from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Ta-da! Let me try that again. Ta-da! He just revealed him. Look at this. But well, somebody had a question. You ever had somebody ask a question sometime and the answer's already been answered in school? Uh, so are we supposed to read those chapters and do the questions at the end of the chapter? And the teacher's like, I just said that. I just. Look, watch this. Verse 8. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it's sufficient for us, or sufficeth us. Wait a minute. He said, if you, if you know me. Well, didn't he just say that? If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth, you know him and have seen him. And now Philip says, show us. Go ahead and show us the Father. It'll be sufficient. And Jesus says unto him, have I been so long time with you and yet hast thou not known me? He didn't say not known us. He said me. What does that mean? That's singular. One. One. Philip, he that had seen me had seen the father. How sayest thou then show us the father? Believest that thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. How is it that the Father dwells in him? Because God is a what? Spirit. He fills all time and space, but he is 
possessing this body. He's inhabited this body. He was made flesh because a spirit does not have flesh. He's got flesh and blood and he showed up for one reason and that was to redeem you and I for us to be able to be born again and to become his bride. That's what the mystery is all about. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look at this. And we'll we'll conclude here. Remember, the disciples were instructed to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Remember that? You will find nowhere in the Bible, I repeat it again, nowhere in the Bible where anybody ever baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Nowhere. Look in Acts 2. Look at Acts 2. This was the very first time the gospel message was preached after Jesus had ascended. And matter of fact, I'm going to add this in here and I'll just add it to this. But look, go to Acts chapter 1. Go to, we're going to read the first three verses. Y'all with me? Acts chapter 1. This is Luke. Luke is right. He wrote the book of Acts. Watch this. The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. In Matthew 28, 20, he says, he said, well, let's read it. Remember what he said? He said that y'all need to do what? He says, y'all need to do everything. It says this, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always. He said, this is what Jesus said. You need to teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. This is after he said, baptized in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, right? So whatever Jesus teaches. All right, watch this in verse one. The former treaties I have made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day which he was taken up after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them 40 days and speaking uh, speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. He showed up to him, right? He showed up to him. He began to teach him. And what did he teach him for 40 days? What did your Bible just say he taught him for 40 days? Look in there, look in there. Glean through it, glean through it. The kingdom of God. Which is what? How to get into the kingdom of God. So then we look. Peter takes this message and we'll close right here. Go to Acts chapter 2. Look in verse uh, uh, 37. They heard this message about Jesus and who, how they had crucified the Lord of glory. Look at this. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? What are they wanting to know? We want to, we messed up. We made a mistake. They're repentant. What do we got to do? Look at this. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as our Lord, our God shall call. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What did they do? They preached that you had to be baptized in what name? The name of Jesus. Why? Because he was the one true and living God. Will you acknowledge the truth today? Matter of fact, will you acknowledge the truth which is after godliness? Hallelujah. Once you acknowledge the truth and you've been converted, then when you go and spread this gospel, guess what? You'll be speaking the wisdom of God. You'll be revealing a mystery that was kept since what day? The very beginning. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.